You are all doomed. Today we're going to be talking about the doom loop, which is a theory that has been popularized by one of crypto's most controversial, but albeit quite brilliant thinkers, and specifically someone who has accurately predicted some of the ins and outs of the recent Fed-fueled Bitcoin collapse. The big question on everybody's mind is which direction is Bitcoin heading? Is crypto going to survive this upcoming recession? What's going to happen to my JPEGs? To be clear, the answer to this theory is Bitcoin headed to a million dollars. But the real question is if the traditional market economy slows down and Bitcoin and crypto have been trading more or less in lockstep with traditional markets, how is it that Bitcoin will achieve this? Well, let's go down the rabbit hole with the recent article from Arthur Hayes and explore the theory of the doom loop and how it leads to the million dollar Bitcoin. This one is certified spicy. So you're definitely gonna wanna smash that like button, grab yourself a glass of milk and let's get started. Now, wait a second. Did you know that I actually filmed this doom loop video weeks ago and that I've been waiting for more information to confirm that this theory is actually going to happen? And would it completely shock you to learn that such information has recently come into the picture, which I will be inserting into the end of this video? That's right. The doom loop theory is heating up and you're definitely going to want to watch this one front to back to ensure that you understand not just everything that's happened, but stuff that is about to happen as it pertains to this crazy theory of the doom loop leading to the million dollar Bitcoin. Get all strapped in, get cozy, because this is going to be a great episode. I'll see you at the end of the episode. Today, we're diving into this article by Arthur Hayes. You may know Arthur Hayes as he created BitMEX, the original futures trading platform for Bitcoin. He's got his own slew of issues, but while he's been under investigation for the way he ran BitMEX, he's been contributing on a pretty epic level to the thought leadership here in crypto and just general macro investing. And what we've come to learn about old Arthur is, he's actually pretty smart and quite a writer. I highly encourage you to read this full article on your own, but considering that absolutely none of you are going to do that, I'll go ahead and break it down for you. Now, the doom loop theory is predicated on a lot of current events, which has a lot to do with America and a lot of the Western world's current energy dependencies. It's also coupled with some of the geopolitical tensions that have just arisen between the US and Russia based on the conflict in Ukraine. So let's catch up very briefly. Arthur has written a few articles that lead up to this one, such as Energy Cancelled and a few other ones. Again, I'm not saying I certify everything in those articles, but it's very helpful for you to read them. So I'll link them all in the description below. Of course, right below the FTX US link. Highly encourage you guys if you're not already members of FTX US. It's by far my favorite exchange in the world. I'm actually doing a whole educational series with FTX. This episode isn't sponsored or in any way affiliated with FTX, but I'm going to start using their sign up link as I really think it's a great service for people to be using in comparison to things like Coinbase or Kraken. FTX is just really the one to be using. Anyway, below the FTX link, you'll find all the links for Arthur Hayes' articles. Let me just TLDR these in a really ugly and fast way that might be slightly inaccurate, but it'll at least catch you up. Right now, inflation is spinning out of control. We've also had this breakup between the US and Russia over the Ukraine. Keep in mind, Russia is the largest producer of oil in the world. So with the split up between the US and Russia, the US actually seized hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Russian assets that were held in US dollars. This has created utter chaos in the energy market. Energy is required for everything. So when the prices of energy rise, so too does the price of literally everything else. And even though I am a diehard believer that we need to do something to bring renewable energy into the world, it is objectively the case that fossil fuels create cheaper energy than renewable energy, at least for now. So the point is right now, America is desperately in need of cheaper energy. The US has broken up with Russia. And most importantly, Russia no longer trusts the United States with its currency reserves. Up until just a few weeks ago, this wasn't the case. But because the United States decided to seize Russia's assets in an attempt to sanction sanction them and control their behaviors to de-escalate from a military conflict. Again, I'm not saying it wasn't the right decision, but the consequences of that are leading us to the doom loop. So let's go in and explain what the doom loop is, how we got here, and again, why all this leads to a $1 million Bitcoin. I'm going to be completely clear. 
doesn't mean that it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows. This whole doom loop thing brings with it a ton of rough edges around the economy and potentially very, very tough times for America and the world at large. But it does also lead to a spiralingly high value for things like Bitcoin. Let's explain. The point is the West is underinvested in cheap energy. And without starting a military conflict in Russia, the actual financial sanctions and actions that the West has taken was their own way of trying to put a stop to Russia's actions on a financial level. Now, as Hayes explains here, what's interesting is that the West's financial response was not built on a model accounting for macroeconomic outcomes that might occur in worst case scenarios. He then explains the tail edges, the most extreme case scenarios must be tested if you want to ensure that you understand what will happen in the most extreme of times. Because we're in a time of extremity, of crisis, we're starting to see the outer extreme possibilities be used as primary options instead of only for extreme cases. What he said is that the West did something by seizing Russia's assets that they thought in most scenarios wouldn't lead to an overly extreme response. But the theory is when tested at its extremes, this particular course of action leads to the doom loop. He goes on to explain here how there are policies that have a short-term sacrifice with a long-term benefit or the opposite. As you can see here, there's a short-term benefit with a long-term sacrifice. Now, politically in the United States, it's very common to opt for short-term benefits with long-term sacrifices instead of a short-term sacrifice, meaning you have to swallow the pill today and deal with the consequences today to potentially create a brighter tomorrow. This is largely considered the best way to live your life is to defer gratification and to make good decisions that make your long term more sustainable. However, what we know is that people would much rather prefer a short term solution today, even if it means a potential negative outcome in the future. And this is the way our policies have been written lately is this tastes yummy for a short amount of time. And then we have a descent into goblin town of this tastes foul. Whereas good policies would start with something slightly foul that would lead to something very yummy in the future and sustainably so. The point is that our policies require citizens not to sacrifice today, but instead to sacrifice tomorrow. Now, all of this is just to lead in here. Effectively, what he does is this thought exercise to approach effectively the financial response of the largest possible countries and the smallest possible countries in the response to what the United States just did to Russia. So why are we doing this? Well, the reality is that as the United States is a huge consumer and importer of goods, mostly exports financial services and other types of technology, the reality is that the United States ends up sending out a ton of dollars and getting back a ton of goods and services. And that's how the country Country runs. Well, the question is, where do those dollars go? Well, historically, a country like China can't spend those dollars on almost anything except for long-term treasury bonds. China, in order for it to see any kind of productive yield and not just lose money to inflation, needs to buy U.S. treasury bonds long-term with high interest rates. But now that the mask has been pulled back and people now see that as a potential threat because of what the United States just did to Russia, the question is, where will that money go? So the doom loop. The assets that capital account surplus countries purchase with their savings are extremely important to the economic survival of the West. So that's what we're talking about. The assets that capital account surplus countries like China, which have a ton of capital that they earn for all of the goods they export, well, they need to then do something with the capital or they haven't won anything. So the question is, what do they do with that money? The reason why it's super important is because each of these economy blocks requires the savings of foreigners to pay for their dissaving at a federal level. A country can do one of three things to finance its deficit. In short, what we're saying here is because the United States has a deficit and other countries have a surplus, what we do is we take their extra money and we buy it back with these long-term bonds. This has been the strategy up till now. This is one of three strategies that can occur, which is first, you could sell debt to domestic entities. Second, the central bank can print money and purchase debt issued by its own government. It's kind of very circular there and pretty sketchy. And third, we can sell debt to foreigners. Now, this was the preferred method of choice, meaning as China had hundreds of billions of dollars of United States dollar surplus, the United States would then say, hey, we'll give you an IOU for even more money and we'll take all that money back off your hands. And this is the way that that we offloaded all these surpluses back into the United States. Up until now, the West got away with mostly option three. This is the best possible option. If your country has that high of faith and credit as the good old US of A, this is by far the option that you'll wanna pursue because this one is very low impact on your own economy. In fact, it's fantastic. Hey, let's buy a bunch of stuff and then with all those proceeds, let's take back all that money with more debt. 
So what happens when all of a sudden the idea of a promise from the U.S. government becomes less exciting? Well, if surplus countries, most of which are outside the core Western axis, decide they would rather save in gold, hard commodities, and or Bitcoin, they will not purchase Western debt assets. This is the scenario we're talking about, right? Let's just say China sees what happened with Russia and goes, we really can't afford to have the United States decide to not do business with us, to seize our assets. This could be systemic risk for us. So maybe with these extra US dollars we get, which we have a whole lot of them each and every year, what are we going to do with them? So to be very clear, for the U.S., this leads to very uncomfortably high inflation. For the EU, it will destroy its unnatural monetary but not fiscal union. And in both cases, the central banks will resort to yield curve control. What is yield curve control, you might ask? Well, I got it defined for you right here. Yield curve control involves targeting longer-term interest rates by a central bank than buying or selling as many bonds as is necessary to hit that target. Effectively, this is how it goes. If I'm scared that the inflation is going way up in this country, and somebody says, like the government, hey, I'll give you a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year bond, and in exchange for that bond, you'll get this much percent return. We all know long-term treasuries have a very low rate of return because people have so much faith in them. But the reality is what happens when inflation starts skyrocketing and people do not want to buy the bonds that have lower than 5% inflation. Maybe people don't want to buy the bonds that have lower than 5% of an interest rate. Maybe people stop being interested in anything under 10%. As demand for these long-term IOUs from the government goes down, as inflation goes up, that means they have to keep raising the rate. However, if the government then decides to start buying all the bonds, then that means that it can satisfy its own demand for long-term debt. You might be asking yourself, how would they pay for that? Well, they probably just print a bunch of money. And what happens when these long-term interest rates go up is shorter-term interest rates start to go up as well, and that makes money more expensive, and that makes everything more expensive. So effectively, what you get is wild inflation, and that makes everything more expensive, which slows down the economy, makes people's lives horrible, they can't afford to eat and sleep in the places that they want to eat and sleep in, and you get social unrest. So effectively, skyrocketing rates are bad, the government can fix this by buying its own debt, and this is what yield curve control is, is effectively controlling it so that the long-term interest rates stay low and they do this by printing money and buying their own debt. So now that we understand that because of what the U.S. did in response to Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, there is now a trust problem with the U.S. and the permissioned system of the U.S. dollar. Now the question is, what does China do? Are they going to keep investing in U.S. debts, keep investing in this U.S. monetary system that is clearly has the potential to totally rug pull them, or are they going to pursue alternatives? Now, Arthur Hayes argues here that because of what happened with the United States taking the action against Russia, that this is a foregone conclusion that yield curve control is the end game and that there's nothing that can stop that and that effectively we're on a crash course for other countries stopping buying U.S. debt and instead choosing other ways to take their surplus and earnings off of all their production and goods and services they export to us and sticking it somewhere else. Then he does a really interesting thought experiment. As you can see here, he says that this is for sure the way to get to $1 million Bitcoin and 10 to $20,000 gold. Now, it's actually a really interesting article where he does this thought experiment trying to say, okay, if I was China, could I spend all of my excess reserves on gold? How would that work? And he essentially works it through and shows effectively with all of this excess USD, China still couldn't really fix their issues with their surplus by buying gold and gold alone. He says that this is the way of testing the theory at the maximum or the highest level, considering how big of an economy China is. Then he does the same exact experiment with El Salvador. And he says, all right, well, look, El Salvador is way smaller. Of course, El Salvador could, in theory, buy and store a certain amount of gold. But once they had all their money in gold, how could they then actually make payments? Well, that's fine if you're China. You have a certain level of credit with other countries. But if you're El Salvador, no way is everyone shipping out all kinds of goods and services until payment has already been received. So he's saying that you'd effectively be in the this loop of El Salvador as a country constantly shipping and sending gold all over the world, which is super expensive, inefficient, and no one would probably give them credit against that gold until it was already delivered. Therefore, we end up in a situation where China is too big to rely on gold and El Salvador is too small to rely on gold, and that there are very few Goldilocks countries no pun intended, we're actually using gold as a means of storing surpluses and actually transacting meaningfully as a country is feasible. 
Again, back to the doom loop. In Arthur's words, the shock of canceling the world's largest energy producer from the dominant Western financial system cannot be undone. No policymaker globally can ignore the precarious nature of any funds held in Western fiat currencies and their respective assets. Therefore, the doom loop's occurrence is assured. At the FX maxima and minima, maxima being China, the biggest possible example, and minima, El Salvador, one of the smallest possible examples. Flags, meaning countries, will pursue a savings policy mix that includes storing commodities and purchasing gold or Bitcoin, probably a mix of the two. The fact that the USD and EUR assets are not part of this mix, combined with the entrenched real goods and energy inflation puts the doom loop into motion. The doom loop will usher in a $1 million Bitcoin and $10,000 to $20,000 ounce of gold by the end of the decade. The times they are uncertain, and within the United States economy, inflation, the stock market is crashing. We all see economic slowdown to the tune that we haven't seen since the last major recession. We had negative GDP growth last quarter. Everyone's wondering, what is going to happen to my bags? Now, the reality is, short term, I don't know. In fact, it seems like some pain and blood on the highway is certainly likely, just as we've been saying for the last few months. But when will it end? Because the reality is that all of these things lead to a different type of world, a different type of economy, one in which currency and wealth that is held outside of the control of not just the United States government, but really any government, will become increasingly desirable. And in that world, anything within the decentralized new world will be hitching its wagon to the king Bitcoin, which could very well become the destination for surpluses of nations across the world that no longer see it as viable to buy long-term debt from the United States. So there it is, the theory of the doom loop. To simplify this, the U.S. seizing Russia's assets has led to a distrust that will manifest itself with countries stopping buying U.S. bonds. And that process will lead the United States to print money and buy its own bonds. This is yield curve control. And in this world, this means that other types of nations are storing their surpluses in independent assets like gold and Bitcoin. Again, we have no idea what type of world will result from the doom loop. It's one riddled with high inflation, distrust amongst governments, and probably a lot of unpleasant realities that we haven't had to confront in our very comfortable modern lives. But the reality that I see is one that is unavoidable with Bitcoin headed to much, much higher prices long term as it becomes the only trusted safe haven for wealth across the globe, a crown once held proudly by the US dollar. Again, nothing is so black and white as to assume that there can't be a ton of variation in how this actually plays out. But the facts are the facts. And what's happened as a result of the conflict in Ukraine is most likely a new world order of sorts, a bridge that cannot be uncrossed. And we are forever looking at what life is like on the other side. In my opinion, volatility might be absolutely nuts for the next few months, maybe even the next year or more. But what will happen on the other side for those who are able to protect their wealth, who are able to survive, and who are able to get a big enough exposure to this new digital world of Web3, whether through Bitcoin, Ethereum, other layer ones, governance tokens, using applications, owning NFTs, or any of the assets that are made more valuable by a higher priced Bitcoin and more trust in the decentralized world. In my opinion, the people who understand this powerful transition will be some of the wealthiest and most powerful on earth. Now, just like we were saying at the beginning of the video, this theory has now just gotten a fresh coat of paint because I already shot this video and was ready to publish it for a few weeks, but given the complete collapse of crypto, I wanted to hold off on this theory until things had just at least stabilized because I don't think putting out a video called Doom Loop in the middle of a whole collapse was really the right vibe. But now that we're here and we're looking at a potential depressed market, looking for catalysts that could potentially lift crypto and hopefully separate it from some of the junk that's being pulled down in the vortex of the Fed fighting inflation and other tensions abroad, we get the first signs that China has been completely spooked by what happened that fateful day in February when the United States chose to seize Russia's assets. And now we are kicking off another phase, in my opinion. This is all speculation, but this could very well kick off the next phase of this doom loop scenario where we end up actually exploring the realities that the U.S. might sever ties on almost completely with certain unfriendly countries around the world financially and what that would mean for the US dollar. We see this already. China is preparing for war. This is from Kyle 
Sean Bass. I don't really know anything about this guy, so I apologize if he's problematic. But we see here Wall Street Journal is reporting that China insists party elites should shed overseas assets. This is a first step in effectively separating China and their economy from the United States and the dollar. Let's go ahead and dive into this. So first, Xi orders Chinese banks to risk assess and insulate against potential U.S. sanctions. Now Xi is directing Chinese nationals overseas to divest of any assets. China has been hoarding grains for over a year. One out of five, Xi's playbook is obvious to anyone willing to connect the dots. In January 2020, China updated their foreign investment law, which gives Beijing the power and ability to nationalize foreign assets and investments under special circumstances, which include war. Effectively, what they're saying is any money inside China, they're going to take if there's some kind of special circumstance. And that special circumstance might be manifesting very shortly. So in mid-2021, China's new counter-foreign sanctions law enables Beijing to seize corporate assets and detain expat employees if the underlying corporation simply is complying with foreign sanctions. The groundwork is being laid for a complete seizure of foreign assets and investments in China. If you are an institutional fiduciary or any other fiduciary, you better be rethinking your risk assessment of investing in public or private Chinese companies. Investors lost everything in Russia and they tried to sweep it under the rug. They won't be able to hide the hundreds of billions that would be lost to Chinese investments. For a little bit of context, we have Nick Carter, a crypto OG, just generally a learned individual here in the world at large. He says, I agree. Remember those thought experiments. Okay, the US is willing to sanction G20 nations. How would they react to China's likely invasion of Taiwan? How does China react to the new reality that the US is willing to wage complete financial warfare? Well, we basically know, as Kyle says, China is laying the foundation to sever US and China capital markets. Financial assets controlled by the US are not a reliable store of value for China anymore. So the campaign of divestment accelerates rapidly. That means that China is now dumping on the U.S. market's heads. Not a good thing short term. How can two deeply economically interlinked nations possibly experience a conflict? Great question. Norman Engel asked us the same thing in 1909 in his book, The Great Illusion, arguing that war between industrialized UK and Germany was impossible. It became dogma in the UK, and we know that all the European countries went to war with Germany twice in two very noteworthy world wars in the 1900s. Effectively, the doom loop theory captures the concept that the US dollar won't be the dominant currency across the world anymore, and that the effects of that will drive all nations to first off not trust each other because the U.S. was the most trustworthy and they're no longer trustworthy. Moreover, it's really important to realize nobody's going to trust China as the store of value and no one's probably going to trust Russia as the store of value. So the question is, who is trusted and what is trusted with the wealth of nations? And this, I'm sure you can predict a few steps ahead of where I'm going, is where we get the magic of the doom loop and how it once again lifts the price of Bitcoin into astronomical territory, dragging with it the entire crypto space, the entire Web3 revolution, and the digitization of money and value as we know it, sweeping this entire industry to astronomical new highs. But it's really important to realize this is an absolutely nuts theory. I do not know how this is going to impact everyday life in the United States where I live. I do not know what the pragmatic human consequences of this are. And quite frankly, it's something that we should all be considering. In the end, we want a prosperous and healthy and happy existence throughout all of our lives. However, it's impossible to ignore dramatic financial consequences created by leadership decisions over the last few months. And quite frankly, this leads in my mind to an indisputable and inarguable crypto-centric future, one in which crypto holders are power brokers financially, and that is a world that I see coming here more rapidly than any of us could imagine. But I'm curious, what do you think of the doom loop? Do you think this is a viable theory? Do you think that this can actually happen? And if so, do you believe that Bitcoin will lead the way and be the response, be the answer for the distrust of nations in fiat currency? I'm certainly going to be monitoring this extremely closely throughout this bear market, building aggressively with my teams and getting excited for a digital future that I believe is awaiting for us all. As always, I'll be doing my best to keep you up to date and informed. My name is Elio Trades. You can find me on Twitter at Elio Trades. Got a ton of content for this bear market coming to you. And I'll be with you each and every step of the way, getting ahead of the next cycle. And I believe the people who hang out here, who stay engaged, and most of all, who just understand that the cyclical nature of prices in crypto does not affect the prospect that this industry will eventually conquer and replace closed, unfair, and dated systems of the past. With that said, I'm Elio Trades. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, smash that like button. I thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.